when you're driving? Yeah, me too. And so I started rolling the windows down. Now, note, I didn't say push the button. I had to roll the windows down. And then I rolled the windows back up. And then I turned the heat on. And then I turned the heat off. I turned the AC on. And then I turned the AC off. I turned the radio on. And then I turned the radio off. And the next thing I knew, I woke up driving down the road at 70 miles an hour. And I did what any good 16-year-old would do when he wakes up driving 70 miles on, down the road. I panicked. So I slammed on the brakes and I jerked the steering wheel at the same time. Anyone knows what happens when you slam on brakes and you jerk the steering wheel at the same time? You roll. And my car started to roll back into traffic. I remember going back in traffic and hitting a car. And I, my body started heading towards the windshield. So I grabbed onto the steering wheel. And I yelled for help. I yelled, Jesus! <laughs> and glasses went, went, went everywhere. And we tumbled back. I was heading in this direction from the south. We don't know the difference between east and west. So I was heading in that direction. And I came back going in that direction. And my car landed in a ditch heading in the other direction. Glass was everywhere. And I was laying at the, on the side of the car, inside the car still. And I, was, I could hear people yelling and running towards me. I heard this one lady very specifically. And she yelled, I think he's dead. I think he's dead. And I yelled back, I'm dead. I'm dead. <laughs> Highway patrolman came, and, and the EMS showed up. And, I remember the highway patrolman, he, he kneeled down and he said, son, your mom is going to be happy you're alive. I was laying there with glass in my back. I looked up at him and said, sir, you don't know my mama. She's going to kill me. Because this was her first car, a 1982 Corolla, Corolla, ugly brown car. But what I learned from that was this. But I was so fixated on the what, the car. And what the officer was trying to teach me was about the why. Why my mother would be happy that I was alive and she would not be concerned about the what. I believe that our future is amazing for conservatism. Because I think that as we help to connect the American people's why with our what's the policies that we stand for, that we will win people. And when we win people, we will win elections. John Maxwell said it very well when he said that when you find your why, you find your way. When you find your why, you find your way. And, and, and that's exactly what we're going to do. When we talk about things like Obamacare, this is one of our what's. Obamacare is an atrocity. We're talking about $800 billion of new taxes, new revenues coming to the government from Obamacare. This is an awful piece of legislation. You think about the new 3.8% sales t excise tax in Obamacare, creating $123 billion. Now, this $123 billion comes out of the same pockets where we just took the capital gains rate from 15% to 20%. And now when you add this on top of that, we're talking about a 25% tax. We're heading in the wrong direction. And when we think about the other taxes and revenues that come out of Obamacare, we only can think about awful legislation. But when I think about how I talk about Obamacare, in addition to the taxes, I think about my granddaddy. My grandfather is 93 years old, incredibly healthy guy. As a matter of fact, at 93 years old, he still drives his Ford F-150. Beautiful car. And I think about the iPad in Obamacare. Are y'all interested in the IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, that actually breaks the link between a patient and a doctor? I want my family making the decisions for my grandfather. I don't want 15 unelected bureaucrats making the decision for my grandfather's future and his health. I want that to be a family decision. I know we're going to do it right. And if we do that, as we communicate the impact of Obamacare and we talk about IPAB, we find ourselves having a conversation with the American people that they truly just do not like. 
Obamacare. And that's why they're on our side, because we in America, we are conservative, without any question. We are a conservative nation going in the right direction. When I think about another what, I think about taxes. Now, how many of y'all think we tax too little in the federal government? How many think we spend too much in the federal government? And when I'm on the road, and I remember when I first started running for, for uh, Congress a couple years ago, I started talking about the, the taxes and the revenue streams and the budget. And I started talking about the fact that when you think about it, there's a, this is a couple years ago. We were spending about $3.4 trillion. And what I, what I would say it would get people to take a nap in the middle of a speech, which is not necessarily a good thing, by the way. We want you to stay awake when we're talking. But I'd go through all the numbers, and I'd go through them in about 20 seconds. I'd say a $3.4 trillion budget. We spent about $701 billion on Social Security, $692 billion on defense. I'd say we spent about $660 billion on non-defense discretionary spending. I'd talk about the $519 billion coming out of Medicare. I'd talk about the $400 billion in mandatory spending and $300 billion just to service the debt. Now, if we went back to the 25-year historical average, we'd find ourselves paying over $800 billion just to service our debt. And then I'd close with the $273 billion that we spend for Medicaid. And I'd look out, and everybody would say, ooh. And so when I started talking about how the federal government has a $22,000 income coming in, and we set a budget at $34,000, where does that make sense? Nowhere in America would anybody across the kitchen table who understands that their income is $22,000 decide to spend $34,000. Only in the federal government can that happen. And that's why I understand that we have to control our spending. With a $16 trillion debt and an annual deficit at a trillion dollars, we have to bring fiscal sanity back to Washington, D.C. And when you're on the campaign trail, we have to talk about the necessity of bringing in our spending, restraining it. And I have to make it digestible for guys like me who think about a trillion dollars. When I say that in my audiences, people understand that we're spending so much money that we're having to borrow 43 cents on the dollar. But what does that mean? I, and I talk about my grandfather's F-150. And when I ask people, what, what, what does a trillion dollars look like? They say, well, I don't really know what a trillion dollars looks like. So I tell them that a trillion dollars, for a trillion dollars, you can buy 33,333,000 F-150s. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And then I talk about the necessity of reforming our tax code. Anybody believe that our taxes are just too high still? Absolutely, too high. Uh, we have the world's highest corporate tax rate at 35 percent. We need to bring it down. I, I like Rand Paul who says 17 percent. I think we need to bring it down as far as we possibly can, and then we have to quit double taxing our profits that we make in other countries. We talk about, we're talking about repatriation. We've got to allow for our money to come home to our nation without double taxation. And when that happens, I think we'll grow our economy, because we need to grow our economy and not our government. That is the key. We have to grow our economy and not our government. And when we do that, I think we unleash opportunities here in this country. Another issue that I find to be incredibly important is the issue of school choice. Now, I'm a big believer in school choice. And I got to tell you that it's a part of the opportunities of our future. And if we re remember that every parent deserves a choice, and every child deserves a chance. Now, think back to my young days, growing up in a single-parent household. I think about the tough times that my mother, who worked 16 hours a day, she went to work every day, all day long, came home, and when my grades were bad, she would just pull out the switch. You know what a switch is. So my mama loved me a lot, and sometimes she believed that love comes at the end of a switch. And she proved it to me. But as a freshman in high school, I didn't do very well. I was feeling world geography, civics, Spanish, and English. 
Now, when you fail Spanish and English, they don't call you bilingual, okay? They call you by ignorant because you can't speak in any language. And that's where I was. But I had the blessing of meeting a conservative Republican who became my mentor, a guy named John Moniz. He was a Chick-fil-A operator. And John started teaching me some of the most valuable lessons I've ever learned. He taught me that having a job is a good thing. But creating jobs is a far better thing. He said, if you have an income, that's a good thing. But if you create a profit, you can do the most amazing things. And it started to change my life. And because of John, my mentor, I'm sure that was a part of my path to becoming a red-blooded conservative. Because he taught me how to think my way out of poverty. And my mother taught me discipline, and that combination made such a huge impact on where I am today. And I think about why it all solidified. And I think back to 1986, when John Moniz was 38 years old. Very successful business owner, Chick-fil-A guy. Uh, he died. 38 years old, blood clot, stopped his life. And that was the time when all of his lessons came together. And I realized very quickly, very quickly, that I needed to honor John's memory by the way I lived my life. And so I set my mission statement to positively impact the lives of a billion people with a message of hope, which has a lot to do with my faith, and opportunity that has to do with John's message of being financially independent. And I will tell you that after 13 years as a member of the county council on the local level, and then going to the state house, and then getting elected to Congress, and now appointed to the Senate, I will tell you that John Monise's dream still lives. And I believe that America's finest hour is still ahead of us. That our greatest stand has not yet happened because we are an opportunity society. We are not a society that believes in redistribution. We are an opportunity society. And if we do what it is that we need to do, all of America will stand up and join this conservative movement and help us not only win elections, but win the hearts of people. God bless you, and God bless the most amazing country, America.